Good evening folks, I like a day, it's Paul here, uh, back with my Wednesday night workshops, 7 o'clock, here in the Howard Kramar, and um, over the last few weeks I have been working a while, um, ploughing through the compositions of James Scott Skinner, um, the day I got up to number 260, so got quite a few to go, but um, um, along the way I've, I've found quite a few tunes um, that I had never played, quite a lot that I'd never even really looked at. And so there's been a few, quite, quite a few surprises been thrown up. But at the minute, what I'm working on are tunes for the Logie collection. Um, I played all the Skinner stuff in the Fiddle Music of Scotland, the Scottish Violinist, the Hearn collection, the Miller the Hearn collection, I mean. And I'm on to the Logie collection, and this is the Logie collection, a very handsome book it is indeed. Um, if I can let you see, got the plate at the front. Now this um, is not an original copy. This is a faithful reproduction that was produced by I think it was Aberdeen Aberdeen Council. I think. Give me a second. I think it was. Yes, this is number fourteen, which I kind of thing that I quite like. It's the, one of the very very earliest ones. Um, the reason I've got one of these low numbers is because I actually played at the launch um, of this book at Provost Skeen's House in Aberdeen. Um, I forget the year. I'm not going to look at that. It's not important. So anyway, the Logie collection. So this is the reproduction. And I'm going to be looking on at this tune here. Now, I am aware that you're looking at this back to front. So this is a pointless exercise, but this is Fivey Castle. Now, earlier in the lockdown, now this has been about 26 weeks, I think, I've been doing this. Um, I did play Fivey Castle as part of a slow air workshop, but I'm going to dedicate the whole thing to the tune, because there's actually quite a lot you can do with this. Um, before I go into the music, this is an original copy. So the, the read copy... Is a modern reproduction, but, but in every respect, the, the copies are identical. They've done a beautiful job. I mean, I can let you see this here. It's down to Skinner's picture, the plate that's at the front here. It's identical, so you, you can see they did a great job, which means it's not a, it's not a cheap book to get. I do it's, it's a, an expensive book, and um, this particular one has got a lot of songs. and. I have had a look at some of these in the past, and it's pretty grim stuff, really. The, the melodies are actually not too bad. In some cases, got quite nice melodies, but the lyrics are <laughs> are off of stuff. Here's a, the, they made a look a uh, logie. Here's a, a verse: "Topsy, topsy, glicket thing. This is perfect folio. Sporting here at your swing and the dollies in a holio. Well, whatever that's to do with." So the, the, the songs are not great, but there's some good tunes in this. Now, I'm aware that Nea Abdi has got a copy of this. But these books, a lot of folk didn't really want books out of the place. Personally, I love hearing these things. I, I like working with, with the books. That was um, a copy that I got, um, or my dad bought actually, so it wasn't just for... It wasn't just for me, it was my brother and sister as well, because we are played. And it, it was bought at an antiquarian bookshop in Aberdeen. And um, it's been used a lot, and certainly this old copy, that's where I learnt 5 e Castle Uto. And um, it's a tune that's stood me in good stead for many, many years. Um, I'll play it for a long time, and then I'll I'll leave it, move on to some other stuff, but I like come back. And it's it's maybe not the sort of tune you would do in a workshop, but it's it's quite a demanding piece of music. And you can get a lot into it. So if I'm, I, I'm going to play it through for you for a start. So this is maybe me going to be today with how I go about um, putting colour and expression into a tune like this and how my thinking process. So I'll let you hear the tune for a start. See what you think. <laughs> Right, three flats, so that, that will certainly put some folk off right for, a, for the start, but you can add these tunes with flat keys, they, a lot of great music, it's a, it's a real shame that you have to avoid it because you don't feel comfy playing in flat keys. Um, you just have to practice it. I'm sorry folks, there's no other way around about it, you have to sit down and work on it, and um, 
they can induce a bit of tendonitis, I suppose. Kind of keeping the hands pulled back can be a wee bit awkward. And um, it's, but it's well worth um, working on. Now, 5 Castle, I'll tell you about it in a minute, but we'll play the tune. And it's um, it's got at the top, and it really sets a stall out of what you're looking for. It, it should be played weird and eerie. So Skinner's very clear on fit he's going for here. So we'll come to that in a minute, but this is the tune. I'm just going to play it through for a start. Everybody would agree it's quite a dramatic piece of music. It's not just um, the simplest of things. Um, Skinner wrote a lot of really tricky music, there's no doubt about that. But a lot of why some of his finest um, compositions were the simplest of tunes. But this, I think, it's a, from my point of view, I think it's an absolute masterpiece. And it tells a story. I mean, slow airs do tell stories, um, if you can be bothered to go and find out what they're about. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes you will literally find nothing about it. For instance, a tune called Mrs. Jemison's Favourite by Charles Grant. Uh, Charles Grant was a pupil of William Marshall. It's a lovely, sweet, gentle, melodic tune. Nay, incredibly dynamic. But that doesn't matter. But I have been completely unable to find out anything about Mrs. Jemison. So you're kind of limited and you have to use your own interpretation and sense of taste. But this tune, there's not really much doubt about what this is about. And it's worth reading at the bottom of the book what it says because there's quite a big bit there. Um, for this type of tune, understanding the story you're trying to tell is quite important, I think. And this would extend to any tune, whether it's... Uh, let's see, a tune like Lament for McCrimmon, which is a great story. Um, I'm not going to tell you about that. Took me a while. But if you don't understand the story and the background of that tune, it's it's just about, it's ne it's never going to come across as, as well as somebody that really kens it and feels it. You have to be totally on top of it you're trying to put across. Because if, you, if you're not convinced by it, can they, you can't expect your audience to be. Um, you can do all the dynamics you like, but you, you really want to... Be able to 
um, get inside the story. So here we go. This is Fivey Castle by James Scott Skinner. Weird and eerie. That's what it's instructing you to do. So I'm going to read this out because actually I found this a very helpful thing for me to get my head into tune when I was a younger lad. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm no spring chicken. But um, when I'm trying to get my head around for this tune as a boot and the fit you're trying to express, this was helpful. Um, so it says here, The traditions and legends and ghost stories connected with Fivey Castle are very numerous. A ghost room, of course, exists, and the, the green lady that ish, issues thence, a fatal prophetess of immediate co coming evil to the proprietor in possession, wanders in fearful loneliness through the long corridors till she disappears behind the sliding panel of the dark, wainscoted room. The secret chamber still retains the mystery entrusted to its keeping, whether it contains hidden treasure or some deep dungeon for the disposal of those whose presence was hateful to the laird, or whether it um, is in the entrance, whether it is the entrance to some subterranean passage and way of escape in the case the castle was taken, or whether it is, um, what's that say, tenanted by the mouldering bones of those who were left to pine and die in it must remain a mystery till some proprietor possesses the curiosity to examine and the courage to face the awful fate foretold by the rhymer. That's Thomas the rhymer. Um, a prophet, a seer, you would say, against the ruthless hand that would disturb its silence and solitude. Then there are chambers reputed to have been the scenes of deeds of darkest dye, and truly in a dark winter's night when the wild when the wind is howling outside and the slates rattle and the timbers creak and some sudden gust of wind extinguishes the candle, the feeling that creeps over one must be weird and eerie. Of course, there is poetry connected with the castle. Who has not heard the beautiful and pathetic ballad of Andrew Lamy, the trumpeter of Fivey, in which so touchingly and simple portrayed the hard fate of Tifty's Bonnie Annie, her resting place in the green kirkyard yard of Fivey is marked by a handsome cross over a plain red sandstone slab. This is taken from the castles of Aberdeenshire. So, if that doesn't um, fire up your imagination, I don't can fit. Well, that really paints a picture. And this tune is really... Mainly, I mean, it, it, it's all about these elements, but it's 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 mere focused on the Green Lady, who was a real lady called Lilius Drummond, and she was murdered by her husband, um, nay, murdered by a knife or poison, but left to die in a room that was bricked up. They had four daughters, and um, he wanted a son. She didn't seem to be producing a son, so he blamed her, and decided he wanted a new wife. So she was left to die. And um, the green lady is Lilius Drummond. So um, the second half in particular is supposed to su suggest the ghost of the green lady coming doing the second half. Sorry, do, doing the, the stairs, doing the great staircase. I mean, once you, once you realise what that is about... It, it really colours your, your interpretation. Um, apart from the key, it, it's on all, it's all in first position. Some of Skinner's trickier stuff can be, um, it can involve lots of tricks like left hand pizzicato, double stops, um, way up the fiddle as far as you can go. But this really just needs to be in the first position. But there are quite a few double stops. So there's a few technical things you have to really be aware of, but just taking your time, then I get too scunnered, I'll be quite honest, it, it's easy to get put out by some tricky tunes, but it's well worth, well worth um, trying to get to grips with this. So, um, having got a feel for a tune, uh, my first thing would be get your fingers on the notes, um, and once you've got that comfortably under your fingers, you then really start to develop the story, because it is a story. Slow airs are songs without words. 
you kind of got the luxury of lyrics that how, how you play it and express it should be like a movie soundtrack. And if I'm doing workshops at schools, I'll use this tune as an example of um, something that tells a story. I want to tell the kids, fit, fit, is this tune about, I'm fit all day, as I'll say, I want you to close your eyes and listen and fit as this um, music say to you. Imagine it's a film. What's going on in the film? And of course, um, because it is pretty dark, but you'll get a lot of, oh, there's been somebody's deed or somebody's sad. There's been a battle. Somebody's gone away. These are the kind of things that you get time and time again. Sometimes you'll get somebody that really hits the nail on the head. Um, there's, somebody's died. It's a ghost story. So treat it like that. It is like a ghost story and it should be played um, in, in the kind of fashion. So it's, it's very dramatic. You would never play a tune like Mrs. Jameson's favourite, as I mentioned earlier. You'd never play that like this. Totally inappropriate. So you have to you have to colour the music to suit the story. So if we go back to the beginning, and what something I always say: pull out your long notes, keep the short notes short. It's one of the key things for getting Scottish character into your tunes, um, regardless of whether it's piping or fiddling. I'm not, not going to speak for any other instruments because I'm I don't feel equipped enough to. to to discuss that but I think it is a very common thing in Scottish traditional music that the, the long note is pulled out and the short note is very very short. So that first bar you get the idea so Pull out long notes. I, I, I mean, the way I would interpret that is it's 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 giving the music a lot more tension, and that is something you need in a bit of music like this. Tension, and drama. up and pulls back. This particular tune is one of the most extreme tunes that for for change in dynamics and change in the ebb and flow, how the tune pushes. When you get louder you push the tempo, when you get slower and um, you pull it back, sorry, you pull it back when you get quieter, so the end of a phrase or a measure you tend to get quieter, so there's a sense of, like this, on the bigger scheme, you couldn't say, ah, uh, a metronome to this, however, and that just kills it. It's just, oh, drudgery. To, to play it like this, I mean, you, I find myself playing it and I, I'm instantly shutting off. So if I play it like this. and you're not thinking that sounds the same to me if it's, if it's you complaining about to me that's just incredibly dull um, there's no colour on that now that first four bars I mean it's there's a lot going on in four bars that is repeated now like on a slow air I would never play it the same the second time when you repeat it it's a different part of the story I mean although the notes are the same you, you, you should really be trying to do something different with it moving the story on so for the first time I would, I wouldn't hit too too hard, I would kind of let the tune develop as I go. So the first time. And it builds. 
what's up. Second time, really go for it. Their drama. Your vibrato really helps. at the end of the measure. When you go into the second part, it's much more d dramatic. I mean, you will find that the tune begins to move. By and large, in slow ears, there's, there's more drama, more crescendo um, in the second half. But within that first but, but you, hopefully you can hear that when I've repeated a bit, I've treated it differently. Now, you could mark it more tender. This is just how I do it. So I'm not saying there's one right way to do it because it's really due to the player. But I think it can be helpful to hear how somebody else interprets it. So, um, so I try never to mark it identical and never to just play it in one level start to finish. One tempo, one volume. It's like doing poetry in monotone. Um, or if it watches these, I mean, actually, aren't that many folk watching, but I've done, I quite often use this as a comparison. If you're doing poetry, now, Tama Shanter is a good example because it's the same sort of. Um, aesthetic, I suppose it's a it's a ghosty story. So if you start it like this, when Chapman bullies leave the street and Ruthie neighbours neighbours meet, when market days are wearing late and folk begin to duck the gate, as we sit boozing at the nappy and getting food and uncle happy, we think that the lungs got smiles, the mosses what their slaps and styles that lie between us in our hay. I'm just a bit fine asleep now. I, I have heard burn suppers for the the, the guy at Steen Tama Shanter. Nay, nee, I a guy, of course, but quite often a guy um, does the hail thing like that. And it is impressive to hear uh, 15 minutes of poetry memorised. Um, however, it doesn't really tell the story. It's just r repeating something that you've memorised. You're not really telling the story. Now, I'm not saying I'm the, the world's best, but this is much more effective. When Chapman Billy's leave his street. And druthy neighbours, neighbours meet, as market days are wearing late, and folk begin to tack the gate. As we sit boozing at the nappy, and getting foo and unca happy, we're thinking of the long Scots smiles, the mosses, water slaps and styles, and there's somebody at the door. Sean isn't here, I might have to go and look myself. <laughs> um, if you didn't mind, I've got the boys in the house here myself, somebody's at the door, I'm just going to go and see if it is. Give me one minute, I'll tell him I kind of stop. Just give me a second. That lie atween us in our home, where sits our sulky, sullen dame, gathering her brows like gathering storms, and nursing her wrath to keep it warm. Do you get the idea? I hope that it comes across, because well, to me it makes perfect sense. It's the same sort of thing about telling a story, and that Fivey Castle is very much like that, so the fra how you phrase it, the pushing and pulling, the dynamics, make a massive amount of difference to a tune like this. Now, I appreciate this is not the tune you might play with an orchestra or a fiddle group or at sessions, but musically speaking, it's a great bit of Scottish music. And um, 
it's well worth challenging yourself and this will on every level. When I used to compete with this tune, um, when I was finished practicing it, I was exhausted. Not just physically, because it takes a lot of control one way or the other, but mentally and actually emotionally as well. I'd be just, I'd get to the end and we'd be like that. And that's what it should be because there's a sense of pouring yourself into that story. And if you can do that when you practice, when you go and play it at a competition or at the music hall in Aberdeen or forever, you've got an audience. If you can do that time after time on your own time, it's far more likely you can do that when you've got a big audience or when it really counts. So anyway, the, the things in the, the start of this that you need to watch. Now there's three flats, kind of do on about that. You'll just have to get out of it. Um, but there's these double stops. Now, these are the hardest ones in the hail tune, actually. You've got the first finger on the D string and then a fourth on the E. A, sorry. It's an open E. Would be, no, it would, it would be an E flat. So, so there are two E flats. And there's one there as well. So it's an A flat twice high. So it's... Now, a lot of folk have problems with their fourths. I cannot. But they're tough, really. <laughs> and if you didn't get hear that, what you get is this. Alright, it's I mean it's quite sweet really. If I play it with a double stop, so helps with the eeriness. stops here now that last bar the double stops very easy because one of them is iron open it's an iron open string so so it's so that's that's fairly easy I would say for double stops um, get the melody notes all right first. Once you're comfy with them, then start putting the double stops into it. I would tack them on their own and work through them on their own um, before I try to put them in the tune because it's just, it's going to really weigh the thing down too much. It's it's demanding enough without adding in other double stops. So add them in a wee bit later. Just get you get the feel for the tune, it's a sense of the dynamics, and um, then... It's like the ornamentation, you kind of don't worry about that too much until later. Um, although I would say you, you want your um, grace notes to be something that, that appear very much organically. It should be an instinctive thing because they need to be second nature. And this is why I, I found I used to trip up with my classical music when I was playing at school because I couldn't help myself. I didn't even realise that I was playing grace notes. they just come in for the space. And so that would, of course, happen... And I had Mr. Linklater giving me grade five tunes and it was like, no, no, you can't do that, man. <laughs> so, an example of the grace notes. Yeah. And again. This thing clean, never too much the four, the, the twinkle about in the background, never disrupt the, mel the flow of the melody. They should never be close to being mel uh, melody notes. Sometimes I've, if I'm teaching, that's one of the things, the, the me melody notes are they're kind of being squeezed a bit by the grace notes being too, too big, and so they're, <laughs> they're taking over a little bit. Here again. 
quick. Something like that, they shouldn't be as slow that you can pick out fit they are. Like that, it's almost a percussive feel that you should be hearing. Tune like this, I mean for volume, speed of the bow is really far it comes for you. You can intensify things with the vibrato and um, I mean didn't I want anybody to tell you that oh vibrato that's a classical thing, it shouldn't have been folk music, that's bollocks. That's what I'm saying, you can tell them I said that, it's nonsense, it's a tool to colour the music. There's lots of things it's not appropriate for, I mean you, you wouldn't have kind of clorted out or your strapes and, re <laughs> and reels but in slow airs they, they add colour. I mean, some of the, the finest traditional singers have great vibrato, and it's about, it's adding colour. The fiddle's no different for that. With this, it can give you extra power. Should get a bit of heat into that bottom note. So very dramatic, the vibrato will help, but the speed of the bow it really, really helps bring out the dynamics. So the, the bow speed is going to vary a lot in a tune like this. Quite quiet, so slow. See that's, that note is kind of, it's going like that, it's, it's, it's blossoming. So if you notice the, the bow speed increases. These big bows, it's um, it's to get tone. Double stops, make sure they're well balanced. You don't want the harmony note dominating the melody. Now we come on to the second bit here. Two bars, sorry. You get this really dramatic, um, fast-paced bit of music there. Um, the speed gives you the drama. It's trying to suggest the ghost coming down the stairs. Um, if you tell that to folk before you play it, they're kind of ha ha ha. Until they hear it, and they're like, oh, right, I, I can hear that now. Um, you should almost feel the hairs rise in the back of your neck there. Your hackles should be up. Kind of hot, intense tone at the bottom. And then pull it right back. Because you've kind of got to do that, otherwise the next time you play it and you're looking for drama and hopefully squeezing a bit more drama and intensity out of it, if, unless you've pulled it right back, you, you did not get that contrast. So by pulling it right back at the end of the phrase, it's like breathing for the singer, get the end of the phrase and then you do the next bit. You should, you would never do that on at one pace but because you've pulled it back the next time you go for it it's, it's going to be really effective. So start there again, second half. but not quite. I've not gone for it quite as much as third time. Just for contrast.
you like that last note taper off nicely at the end um, the, the tune I've posted for here Fivey Castle um, for the music went up the fingering that's written on at the end so that's just Skinner's own fingering it's exactly how I play it and I kind of see a better way to do that uh, it just works absolutely fine so let that be a guide um, I, I wouldn't I follow stuff like that I sometimes find my own way but for that that actually does work so just um, it's a different mood at the end actually it's much lighter it's not as dark going into a mere a, a major feel it's not quite so gloomy um, thoughts of dungeons and murders and <laughs> it sort of resolves itself a wee bit so anyway that that's that's pretty much how I would treat that take your time be thorough and spend time on it really spend time on it um, if you play the fiddle hopefully it's because you like it um, and something like this you treat it as a challenge it's not Abbey's cup of tea I'm not naive enough to think that Abdi wants to play this but as an exercise in trying to stretch yourself musically, it is a great thing to work on um, because there's so much you can do with it and there's so much room for different interpretation. This is how I play it. But I'm not sitting here telling you this is the only way to do it. I'm telling you this. Do it my way. Nothing else works. That is not true. There are certain things that wouldn't work. <laughs> and I've said some of them, kind of, if you play it like a monotone with no dynamics, you're going to hey, I'll be sleeping. Certainly probably thinking about fit their hand for dinner later in the evening and the mind will wander. You want to keep folk engaged on the story, start to finish. And when you get to the end of the tune, there should be a sense in the room, hopefully, and it, if you hear slow airs played very well, there should be a sense that there's you could hear a pin drop, that there's nobody in that room that's listening would even want to breathe almost because it'll break the magic. That's the kind of thing you're, you should be looking for that you really have folk hanging on the story if they start to finish. So, I'm going to play again. Anybody who's playing along, um, good luck. Because um, <laughs> it's one of these tunes that it's, I, I find... Um, I, I think I'm quite difficult to accompany because I do pull the, temp, the tempo and slow airs around a lot. So you can imagine with this type of tune, or anybody who's trying to stick with me, it, you can get these sudden accelerations. It must be a nightmare. Um, so that's probably why I quite often play unaccompanied <laughs> but it means I can completely please myself how to treat it so I'm going to go fair the top and then um, play it at the end and then that'll be that so here we go, Fivey Castle Weird and Eerie
So I hope it's been a wee bit of an insight into uh, how I would play it. It's, I was well aware this is maybe not so much the kind of workshop that folk will be trying to play along, uh, <laughs> get to grips with it, but that there hopefully has been some kind of sense of how I would personally take a tune like that, and I think most of the points are, are pretty valid, um, but it's not the only way to skin a cut. I'm not telling you to go and skin cuts, by the way. But um, you can't fit what I mean. You can't fit what I mean. Um, bow control is a big thing with a tune like this. You can, if your bow starts bouncing, it's going to be difficult to pull off this kind of thing. So uh, working on your bow and it is time well spent. You want um, to be able to use the hail extent of that. Difficult to put in a lot of intensity and a lot of power for it's needed if you tootle a boot in the middle of the bow. It's not very well to use a microphone and a speaker, you can to <laughs> But you're better, better off trying to develop the, the facility to deliver that through your playing rather than li relying on technology. So um, just spending time. It doesn't come necessarily that easy, I will say that. Um, you have to work to, and you have to want to kind of develop. So there you go. I hope that's been okay for you folks. That was a bit longer than I expected, but I'll, I will say... I did think this this is a kind of tune, there's a lot you can put into it. Um, it has got background that you can go into that will help hopefully help folk. Um, one of these types of tunes, find out what you can, because that is absolutely going to be the key to expressing the melody. If you can, what the tune's about, you can, you're halfway there. So anyway, thanks very much. If you feel like chucking something in the tip jar, that would be grand. I'm doing it anyway, but if you do, that would be grand. It's um, www.paypal.me forward slash um, Paul Anderson Shona Dawn. Um, apologies for having to nip out to the door. It was a wife who came to the door delivering headphones, believe it or not. <laughs> it's, um, they were for Shona because she's doing the administration for the Talent Food and Music Weekend, which is in two, two and a half weeks. And um, she had the entire festival organised. Pretty much often was in place and it had to be cancelled and she has now had to go and organise an entire virtual festival and it's involved a huge amount of video clips and stuff that need to be edited and put together. So she's been busy doing that. So she's actually out trying to get stuff uploaded to the best of her ability. So that's why I had to nip to the door. It could have been anything. So I'm glad I went because she needs the earphones. So I'm rambling now. Thanks for looking in. I do appreciate it. I mean, it really... You never can how many folk are going to look in. Um, I'll be here next week. Um, if anybody wants to suggest a type of tune or a particular aspect, just send me a message. Any questions, I'll, I'll get back to them. I kind of do it while I'm doing this. But if, if you have any questions, I'll answer them. And I'll certainly say thanks online to everybody who's looked in. Um, but if you've got anything, any aspects of Scottish fiddling or Scottish music that you maybe think I could enlighten you upon I might nay I might not have a clue but if, if I can help I will and if there's something particular you would be delighted for me to work on whether it's a type of tune or a tune in particular I might just look at that just because I'm a nice guy <laughs> of course I might nay let's see if it happens so um we'll see you next week folks um I will certainly be here 7 p.m uk time Friday night live for the lounge I think it might be 28. It's it's going to be um, going on. It's be like Coronation Street, longest ever soap opera. <laughs> so it looks like we're going to be going for a while. But thank you, folks, for looking in, and we'll see you later.